Hello, I'm Ed Justice Jr. with J.C. Agajanian Jr. Two juniors here. Two juniors and a and, senior. Right, and we're with Ed Iskandarian, the cam father, the father of the five-cycle engine, and so many other things. I grew up reading the ads. Ed's a longtime friend, knew my dad and my uncles, and, of course, J.C. Sr. And Ed, uh, special day today, right? Yes, it is a special day, yeah. We got five uh, kind of... I'm one of the five celebrities, I guess. Well, you know, you're going to be turning 91, Ed, and that's just unbelievable. Yeah. Any of us that know you, I mean, you're in great shape. What do you attribute that to? Uh, well, uh, I think maybe it, maybe it helped to be athletic when I was a kid playing on the acting bar and the rings. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. And uh, my teacher in school used to say, talk about health and... Uh, eating the right foods and stuff. Well, I know, I guess that's it. I am smoking cigars, Only that's the only <laughs> bad thing I'm doing, I think. Yeah, you do, you smoke quite a few cigars. When did that start? Well, that started when uh, I used to answer the phone and get uh, a little uh, nervous. And uh, I found that it, at lunch, uh, if I tried one of those cigars, it was it would uh, calm me down. I didn't want to start drinking, so I, I just started smoking those cigars, Good and they choice. did calm me down. So you're different than, see, the kids today, they don't want anything to calm them down. They drink energy drink That's to keep them hyped up. They're different today. They don't want to be calm. You are the opposite. You're a different generation for sure. Yeah. Oh, but by the way, uh, they'd order, uh, it was $3 for a phone call from uh, New York to Los Angeles. So they'd have me relay messages for pistons and things over here. And sometimes I'd have two or three zones to do. And I didn't get them done because of the phone I was answering. That's what made me nervous, yeah. The, you know, so that, you know Ed, uh, they taught, uh, uh, Louis Sinner and uh, Ed both, uh, they, uh, a couple of his early mechanics talked about working on a dirt floor. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And were, was there a problem? Because... Uh, you were doing uh, precision machining, uh, the machines were on dirt. Did you have trouble holding tolerances? Well, they didn't have to buy grinding powder, right? You just used the dirt <laughs> off the floor. <laughs> oh, that happened to be behind Mercury Tool and I, uh, that happened to be a dirt floor too, yeah. Well, a lot of these guys would be sneak on additions and there would be no paving on the ignitions, mm. you know. So, but yeah, we got by all right on dirt floors, yeah. You know, they had a, uh, a banquet for Jim Hall before the Long Beach Grand Prix, the Road Racing Drivers Club, to honor him. Oh, yeah. And you, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is how many different things you've been involved with. You supplied cams to Hall, Franz Weiss, for that, uh, the Yellow Submarine, the IndyCar back then, right? Uh, yeah, that was the uh, Cosworth. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, they needed, uh, so they tried out some little longer duration cams for the Cosworth, and I guess they worked all right. And that was with uh, Fr Rutherford won that year, yeah, and we had cams in that car. 1980, I think it was. Just about then. Yeah. Now let me ask you, cam grinding, you know, you're obviously old school. You, uh, what, well, you have Ed Winfield's cam grinding machine? Is I, I, at his estate, I did buy his uh, original cam grinding machine, yeah. And uh, I, I bought my first cam from Ed Winfield, and. He was our mentor, you know, and we looked up to him and George Riley and some of these famous guys. Uh, when we were kids, you know, we used to, we never realized that maybe uh, we'd, we'd be, uh, well, maybe later on we'll be kind of be men like mentors to the newer kids yeah. coming along. Yeah, he is. But we learned, uh, we learned from those older fellas and... Yeah, Riley, George Riley, Ed Winfield, though, were really like the real pioneers of, of the cam grinding, right? And yeah. the speed stuff. And speed equipment, yeah. And then you guys came along and you took it further. But now we go back, you have that cam grinding machine that was Ed Winfield's, which is really a cool piece of history. Yeah. I mean, because of your knowledge and your experience, I mean, do you still gr uh, grind cams the same way, or is there a lot of computers? I don't think you use any computers. You, you've got it all here on, on what you do. I mean, help me out on that. Well, we do use a computer now. Yeah, okay. Makes it easier. But here was a funny thing. Uh, my son wanted to buy this particular cute computer about 20-some years ago, 
and it was $4,500 made in Santa Monica, California. And uh, we bought it, and it was hard work using that because uh, there's a better way much later. But my, I went to a bid at uh, Downey Aircraft Company, and uh, here were some, here were some cuters looked like the ones that we bought for 4,500. So I bid seven dollars a piece on them, and the first thing you know, I got the bid, and I got them. I drove them home. I said, "Look, these look like the ones you paid forty-five hundred dollars for." He says, "Yeah, the serial number is even later on this one. I'll take this one home." And those had become obsolete in a few years, and better ones were coming. You see, from forty-five hundred dollars to seven dollars, that's about it. Went down that low in value because there are new ways, new, new uh, technology had come out. So did you use those for parts, or were you able to get the computers oh, up and we, running and use them? We don't use it for an adding machine now, <laughs> but we got a, a better one. Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> cam grinding, coming up with a cam is an art, but once you grind the cam and you sell it to somebody, there's no secret. You can look at the cam, you can measure it, you could copy it, right? So how, how did you guys, I mean, here you are, you're in a business and you build a big name, Ed. I mean, you're a legend in this business. How did you build a legendary name when if you did something, somebody could copy it and be making the cam the next day? Uh, yeah, the, the, you can get into the cam grinding business by just copying what's on the market and, and do pretty well. But uh, what I did is uh, I lucked out because I was willing to try some crazy things stuff that might not work or be against grain, you know. And I like uh, in NASCAR, they were running flatheads, and I happened to make this uh, practice cam with no clearance ramp and uh, really slappy action. It was noisy, and it would slap the valve open, and the timing was short, so the mid-range power was good, and yet the gop end was good because the other cams they made were uh, soft action cams, good for the top end only and a little mushy in the mid-range. So that's how I got in with NASCAR, and that was uh, accidental. I didn't know they were going to be uh, running flatheads and getting big like they did in NASCAR. Well, it was all flatheads to begin with. And, and I'll tell you what, those NASCAR boys love the torque coming out of the turn. They yeah. loved those cams, and they were noisy, and they didn't care. They slapped that's the right. bells. They'd slap yeah. them open, it wouldn't matter. They, they loved the power that you gave yeah. them. Yeah, now that, like you said, that was in the beginning. That's, I, my family was living in the South at that time when they yeah. became the first right. sponsors of NASCAR. Right. Yeah. And a guy you definitely had to work with who was a good friend of my dad, my Uncle Zeke, Red Vote. Oh, you Red made, Vogt. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I never got the neat dead dope. I admired him and I used to hear about him. And one day, when I used to be across from Metal Rocks, he says, Ed Book was here yesterday, and I told him you were across the street. And he went over to see, and the door was locked. Oh, I was oh, sick about bad. that. I says, the salesmen were bothering me over and over that day, oh, locked and I up. locked the door on the wrong day. <laughs> and because uh, he was very famous and smart, yeah. Yeah, he won a big race, and they caught him on this Buick V8. He had shortened the push rods. Well, that, you can't get, yeah, that was crazy, wasn't it? Shortened the push rod so the lifters, hydraulic lifters, could not pump up. That was the reason he did that. Well, Sm Smokey said he was the original oh. master mechanic in NASCAR. That's and, true, yeah. of course, Smokey would know. Yeah. And you worked with Smokey, didn't you? Yeah, I worked with Smokey. And one day I went to visit him in uh, Orlando, no, in uh, Daytona Beach. And he was working with Ford then. He says, uh, he didn't ask me how to get more horsepower. He says, how do you get the engine to use more fuel? And I thought for a minute, I said, well, you could richen it up a bit, but wait a minute. If it didn't like it, it would slow down and wouldn't draw as much fuel. The only way you can get the engine to use more fuel is to get, get it to use more air. So you got to have the air with it, you know, and that takes breathing biometric efficiency, which we learned from 
Ed Winfield, yeah. And of course, that's what a supercharger is all about, isn't oh, it? That's right. Pumping more air into the motor that it, it necessarily sure. doesn't really want. But and we're talking, we were talking about Smokey Eunuch, JC. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, now this isn't a technical question, but you are known as the cam father, and understandably so. Where'd that come from? Well, uh, Pete Millar, the drag racing cartoonist, who was a drag racer himself, he had. Uh, the new picture, The Godfather, had come out. Mm -hmm. and he said, I think we'll do some cartoons about you and The Godfather. And I said, Godfather? Why don't you make it Cam Father? Oh, he so said, yeah, you yeah. came up with it. Yeah, he, he, I wouldn't have thought of it unless he'd said Godfather, and I thought Cam Father. Perfect. Somehow Perfect. that worked out, yeah. Well, all these years later, it stuck with you. Ed, uh, great talking to you, and it was great for you to be one of the five guys honored here. Of course, Stu Hillborn. Fred Carrillo, whose real name is Fred Carrillo, but nobody ever calls him by that. Uh, Louis Center and Nick Arias, your 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 lunch buddy. Right. You you yeah. and Nick have lunch all the time at the yeah. burger stand down there in Gardena. So right. anyway, well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so now here we we've got Ed Iskandarian, who we've been talking to, and of course J C Agajanian Jr., myself Ed Justice Jr. Now we've got Louis Center, Anson. Uh, he's had other companies that had Center in the name, but Anson, most people didn't realize, was the put together of Jack Andrews and Louis Center, and from Andrews and Center, Sen, Anson. And you know, when I was growing up, Louis, of course, I've known you forever, but there was a point in time at the drags that every car had a set of Anson wheels and an Anson decal on it. It was like Isky. I mean, there were, you know, Iskandarian Cam t shirt, Anson t shirt. Uh, Moon Eyes t-shirt, a BMM Transmissions t-shirt. I mean, these were all the names that uh, my generation, we grew up with. Yeah. We, went, we went to the A.J. Foyt auction. I tell you a funny story about Louie. Yeah. We go to the Foyt auction. A.J.'s got all this stuff up there. He's got the midget that my dad restored for him, the Hollywood Spring and Axle car, in fact. Yep. And, uh, and so Louie buys a lot of stuff. Louie's always buying stuff. He's always selling stuff. We didn't end up buying anything that day. We almost bought an 18-wheeler. Remember, the 18-wheeler went real cheap. And so Louie has all this stuff that he's bought, and it comes time to pay for it. And he says, hey, I can't, I can't pay for this stuff. Because if Betty finds out, and Betty is his wife, and you know where I'm going with this, Ed, right? If Betty finds out, I'll be in the doghouse for the next, you know, 10 years. So he said uh, to my dad, he says, Ed, you pay for this stuff, and then I'll, I'll pick it up in about a month and give you the money. And I'll, I'll work it out where Betty doesn't find out about it. <laughs> and we said, okay, great. So we buy the stuff. We get the certificate that says we buy it and all that. There's no record of Louis, Louis Center buying anything at the Foyt auction. But he bought a, a couple motors and I forget what else, wheels. And God, I mean, it was. we, bought, we came home with a whole bunch of stuff that they shipped back. Yeah. One of them, so it goes about a month later. And... Uh, my dad says, because we got the museum, hey, Louie, I'd like to keep that V6 motor, the Indy V6 motor. You go, okay, great, you keep that. And, but but Louie says, I want that 4-cam Ford motor. He says, I've got that sold. Okay, so here, pay us for it. So he takes the 4-cam Ford motor. Betty never finds out about this. Yeah. He sell, you sell it to Bob Pettisotti, who puts it into a dirt car that Buzz Shoemaker restored. Right. We end up buying that dirt car. We get the motor back. Oh, he, <laughs> right. he ended up getting the motor back. Everything you got. <laughs> See, it's a small world. So this guy, you know, when you go with him to buy something, though, it, it's it's exciting. It's an it's an experience because well, we we go to these auctions. We wouldn't know what we was buying, but we we'd buy anything. Well, I I remember hearing stories, and there was a book written recently, and and I uh, your brother Chris probably told you. Uh, he bought a copy. I got it from uh, Jeff Haywood. Uh, yeah, gave me a copy of it. And it's about early L.A. history and all that. And it's the most accurate telling of the story of your dad going to Indianapolis, the whole thing. And Chris said, yeah, that's, that's the story. And I said, well, that's the story I was told by my dad and my uncles when your dad came to Indy. And they said, hey, here's another guy from the coast and all that. And, of course, you know, the, the driver your dad had, Troy Rutman, was the hero for so many people. Uh, Dan Gurney, for an example, idolized Troy Rutman. Troy was just, just you know, considered to be really the top of the, 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 the you know, pyramid. And I know Dan and Troy traveled together over in Europe 
there for a while, and uh, he was really quite something. And the youngest winner, is he still the youngest winner, or did I did uh, what do you call it? Beat him? I yeah, think the yeah, one kid did. Yeah, he did. Still like going fishing. There? He's second youngest yeah. right now, but but uh, for many up until a couple years ago, yeah. Troy was the uh, youngest winner and uh, and uh, went back in 1952 and won the deal. But I'll tell you, JC was uh, was one of the guys that wouldn't mind putting a young driver in a good car. And Aggie always had the best equipment. He, 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 he you always know, did. Yeah. yeah. And, and a, lot of, a lot of car owners wouldn't put a driver, an untested driver, a young guy, in a good piece of equipment because they, they, they didn't want to take a chance on their equipment. But Aggie was real good about seeing talent, recognizing talent, and giving a guy a chance. And later on in years after Troy won, uh, there was a very young uh, Parnelli Jones that he got put into a great piece of equipment, went back to Indy, was rookie of the year in that number 98 car, and then won the 500 for Aggie's second win. So it's, uh, it paid off, and, and, he, and, and I think the reason, Louis, and, and I don't know if, uh, my dad wanted to be a race driver. He promised his father that, that he wouldn't race cars, even though he snuck off and did race a little bit, but, but an Armenian promise to his father is a, is a strong promise, so he made a promise to him. He made a promise to his dad because his dad was worried about him. And, and uh, racing cars, you guys, was not a real high. Uh, you know, being a doctor and a lawyer—that's one thing. But being a race driver, you know, yeah. the dads didn't want that to happen. They were scared. No, so, being a race listen. driver back then was lower than being a <laughs> motorcycle gang member today. <laughs> yeah. so seriously, people don't understand that. It was just not highly looked upon, it, and it wasn't a way to make really? a living. No, that's I true. mean, let's face it, most of the guys that, that were your contemporaries and that we grew up with, they didn't make money driving race cars. No, never. Never. You know, driving race cars, uh, race car, you got to love it. It was a hobby. Yep. yep. And, and that's the way... In fact, in my shop, they used to come down my shop. I, I used to sponsor half the guys over there. Willingly or unwillingly, they would get the part. You'd, well, you'd be a sponsor, all right. Like Chet, Chet Miller, who was one of the Novi drivers, right. he ran an upholstery shop in Glendale. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was an upholsterer. But he, yeah. he uh, you know, yeah. it come, come Indy, they go back for the month and be a race car driver. Yep, so it, Ed, I think that's the reason that Aggie was so good about recognizing talent because in his heart he was a racer. He was a racer first and a promoter and car owner second and I think that's why he gave these young guys a chance in the good equipment where other dry, where other car owners wouldn't. Right. Well, well it was a different thing, era back then the, totally. Aggie was very very good to the industry. Now you guys they, they mentioned while we were here today that you guys and I've got an original copy of Hot Rod magazine that you had an ad in the original copy of Hot Rod magazine. So Bob Peterson, here he is, this young guy. He comes out of the movie industry. He's got this idea to do a magazine. It wasn't the first. There was Speed Age and other magazines that had been around, Motorsport from Europe. And, uh, but, I mean, who, do you remember who sold you that ad? Was it uh, Vic Edelbrock that says, hey, I'm going to run an ad? Or did, did you actually get called on by Bob Peterson? Bob Peterson used to hang out in my shop. Bob Peterson used to come down. Use my telephone, didn't cost no money. He could sell ads for the magazine. Oh, he'd use your phone to sell ads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have, still have your dad's golden toothpick that was given to him by uh, Evil Knievel? I do indeed, yes. Because uh, your dad was giving him so much of the gate, a percentage of the gate, and he had a man counting out there. And you, your dad was honest. He gave him the exact amount, so he gave your dad that golden toothpick. <laughs> That's, right. That's an accurate story, too, because yeah, he, evil, unbeknownst to your dad, uh, had, a, uh, had a guy checking the gate. With yeah. a clicker That's on all right. three gates. Yeah, well, see, because, why? Because evil had already learned the promoter routine. Oh, the, right. Yeah, you know, we only had 500 people here tonight, and the place is sold out, you know? Sure, and in <laughs> fact, evil came to pick up his pay the next day after that big event. The first time it was on Wide World of Sports, and it was the first time that he jumped uh, professionally and nationally on television and uh, Aggie was on the phone to USAC and he he threw the envelope that my brother Kerry had given him from out of the uh, a, a box office and he gave it to Evil and he looked through it and he counted it and he threw it back across the desk at Aggie and said this isn't right and and Aggie said what do you mean can what do you mean that's not right how do you know what what was right you didn't see my books yet or anything he said I had a guy on each one of your gates with a clicker and I know that that's not right Aggie you overpaid me and, and Aggie sat back and laughed and said, hey, 
when I make money, people that work with me and for me make money. Make and that's when he said, Aggie, your word is as good as gold. And that's what Mr. Iskey was saying. Uh, Ed, uh, par, uh, yeah. Evil said, uh, Aggie, your word is as good as gold. And there's also, besides that golden toothpick that my dad showed you, a gold nugget that's the size of your thumb. And that was on the other side of that key fob. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a beautiful deal. Yeah. yeah huh. Nice. And it'll be on eBay tomorrow. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, well, you know, Evil had a gold walking stick, of course, and all yeah, that. With yeah. Wild turkey so he gave your dad the miniature version of it. Yeah. There's well. a toothpick. But anyway. <laughs> But anyway, no, you know, going back to the old hot rod, though, Ed, you, you did a lot of advertising in the magazines. Yeah. And then it got to the point where the magazines changed. Did it become too expensive to advertise in the magazines compared yeah, to the old did. days? It did. Well, we lost our advertising agency. That was one thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the $3,000 ad from the old days now is about $10,000 a month, you know, for a full page. So, uh so we, we, I was amazed. I started uh, kind of bragging in my ads, and I always thought that some engineer is going to really shoot me down. Uh, maybe I'm not saying things just right, but by golly, it never happened. Uh, what it was is uh, we, we'd begin to get a kind of a broad experience grinding a lot of different camps, and uh, so there was a lot of, we'd build up quite a bit of knowledge uh, on the, uh, they're building hot rod engines and doing crazy things, you know, and wild cams. You Here, might call here's it. another thing. Everybody always felt that because hot rod was on the West Coast, and of oh, course, yeah. you know, the West Coast was a hotbed of hot rodding activity. It's like what came first, the activity. I mean, did the activity grow because of the magazine, or did the magazine grow because of the activity? Oh. And but then again, I mean, for both of you guys, if you weren't located on the West Coast. Do you think you could have been as successful as you were? I mean, with the magazine on the West Coast and you not being here, the fact that they were able to come to your shop, report about it, get written up in the magazines, that had a big effect, didn't it? Well, it did. Yeah. That was very important. Being being local was very important. You know, all yeah. get together on the sh for the for the magazine. Yeah. Well, uh, Barsky was putting on that hard rod show at the Armory. Yeah. Down in Barsky. Barsky, yeah, Barsky. and he hired two fellas, Peterson and Lindsay, to get the good-looking hot rods to put in the show and uh, sell booth space to the speed shops and the manufacturers. So uh, those guys, those two guys got the idea, maybe we ought to put out a hot rod magazine. And we heard that Barsky found out about it, so jokingly he told them, hey, boys, you work for me. I hear we, we have a magazine coming out. And he was just joking because he didn't want to put any money oh, yeah. into that magazine. But that, that, that got going and he would call, come in person to collect the $10 for the ad. We were paying $10 a month for the ad. You know, a very rare magazine though that they just recently reprinted in a book form was Throttle. Oh, and you, you wrote for Throttle and so did your uh, brother. I used to write stories for it all the time. It was time. only around one year. Yeah. One yeah. year. It's very rare. Very hard to find. Yeah. They found a complete set, and uh, and uh, they reproduced them in a book form. But but you wrote for that. And then, yeah. you know, here's another thing. People don't understand that you guys, your careers were so touching upon so many things. One thing I can think about with you, Louie, is that you uh, supplied the motor to Barris for the uh, Munster coach. That's right. For that the TV show, The Munsters. The and Munster and car and I built the the, the a carburetor uh, manifold for a for the, the Munster coat for George Barris. I see George all the time. Right. All right. Well, guys, thanks a lot. Okay. Ed right. Iskandarian, Jay Sagajani, and Louis Center, myself, Ed Justice Ed Jr. Justice doing a great job. Well, the microphone. Thank, oh, thanks okay. a lot. We had a great time today with all the all the people, and uh, what a great, what a great tribute. Thank you. All right, Ed Justice Jr. here. I'm with Dick Martin. He's the guy that's responsible for this great event that we had here today. Uh, it's not the first time he's done it, although you told me it's the last time you're going to do it. It's the last time, Ed. You know, uh, Ack was a special kind of guy, and we, you know, that was something that I, I it was a no-brainer. Uh, of course, Tom Medley, Stroker McGurk, uh, one of the first employees of Peterson, all the things he did as a publisher of Rod and Custom. 
And just the, the nature of the guy, uh, that was a no-brainer. These five guys today, well, they're, like I've said many times, long after they're gone, uh, their names will be remembered. And uh, to get them all together, I'm sorry that Stu's health is such that, and that's one of the things that concerned me about doing this, it was now or never. Uh, and of course, I honestly believe that Iskio will live to be 100 and be just as sharp as a tack. But, the, you know, this legacy is going away very quickly. And these are all World War II, four of them are World War II veterans. And of course, uh, uh, Nick is uh, Korea, but uh, think about what they did. They went off to war, they, they fought overseas. Ack Miller almost had his feet amputated because of the uh, Battle of the Bulge. And they came back and started companies and careers, and uh, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's the great generation of hot rodders and the great generation of Americans, really, where if, you know, the trades that the, those guys learn in school have carried them all through to, till today. Yeah, and interestingly enough, a lot of this stuff, like Act Mil Miller, Battle of the Bulge, a lot of that stuff was not really known by a lot of people till it got later in life. That's true. They came back from the war, they went back to work, they carried on now in a new life. And exactly. the war was behind them, and they did their best not to carry the baggage and the battle scars of what they went through. Absolutely. Anybody that doesn't know the history of the Battle of the Bulge should look it up. Today you can Google it on the internet and read about it because uh, that was a monumental battle that uh, we took a lot of uh, casualties in. The Germans showed up in white uniforms in the snow and our guys were there in the green uniforms and you could spot them a mile away and anyway, it's, uh, that's another story. But, but no, these guys are, are really some of the core guys of, of so much of the history of not just hot rodding. I oh, mean, wow. this is a thing that a lot of people don't realize and Dick, you know so well. You know, it's like I asked Iski earlier to tell us about being involved with Jim Hall's uh, IndyCar when they won in like 1980, 81, somewhere along there that had an ISKI cam in it. And a lot of people didn't realize that. And they, they don't understand that it all started really in hot rodding. Dan Gurney was a hot rodder. Oh, yeah. Phil Hill was a hot rodder. Boy, all, yeah, all these guys were hot rodders before they became road racers, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. it started on the streets. Exactly, it, it branched out just like uh, Fred Carrillo. Uh, he couldn't afford to go to the lakes. He was just a kid and his mom was a single parent. So he street raced. He admits it, and he's no bones about it. He got kicked out of two high schools because he kept street racing in the front, and he went on to Hollywood High. He was not uh, a child of wealth, and any of these kids will tell you uh, when they grew up during the Depression, no, their parents were just uh, struggling to get by, but they never looked for a handout. These guys created their own jobs if they couldn't find one. And, and, and funny enough, none of them went into it for the money. They, they loved it. They, it, it was, as it was said many times today, and I was really happy to see this, it was a passion. Because that's what it is. You gotta be passionate about something. It's not a job then. It's, it's a passionate, you know, love, et cetera. And yep. these guys, because they loved it so much, the money just came. And Absolutely. you know, you've heard this saying so many times in my life, find something you like or you love and do it and the money will follow. Absolutely. And these guys are great examples of that. Well, uh, Ed's dad and his two uncles, I mean, those kids uh, grew up with nothing. Right. Uh, his, his one uncle was paralyzed, and they took a, a collection in the town to raise money for his uh, medical uh, costs. But the fact is, they heard of this product called Wins. They decided, gee, I think we're going to try and sell that stuff. And I'll never forget, I rode in the car with uh, Dev was driving and Zeke was rode with us. We went to this place in Arcadia for lunch and we were coming back on foothill towards uh, uh, the business and he said, you know, right about this time I started to cry. Why was that, Zeke? He said, well, I couldn't wait to get to California and now we're leaving and we're going to Florida and I don't know if we knew what the hell we were doing. But we get down there and uh, started selling this wind oil, and one thing led to another, and the rest is history. Right, and they eventually, <laughs> they, they, from that point on, they were working to get back to California. Yeah. They loved their time in the South. They had a great time down there. I was born in, in Florida during that time, and, but they always wanted to get back to California because they had so many friends out here in the yeah. racing fabrication industry and mm -hmm. hot rodding and dry lakes and Bonneville yeah. and drag racing and, and all that. And no, they, 
they're, they're the same like these guys. They, they had nothing, they had a dream, yep. they were willing to work hard, they had a lot of desire, and the rest just followed. Absolutely. And they always, you know, the thing about these guys, like the one story about Louie, he'd give you the part even if you couldn't afford it, and then, you know, see if you can pay me for it. Yep. And like the joke is, some people did and some people didn't. That's right. They, these guys were all square shooters. Yeah. Every single one of them that were honored here today there's not a story that that guy's a crook or no. boy, he really, you know, uh, took advantage right. of me. They were the real deal. They were, they were. And what better place to have it? I mean, the, this place is evolving. I right. mean, all the time, new things coming in, stuff rotating out, people coming in that have never been here before and they're just in awe of the, of the amount of history. So I'm glad I did it and I'm glad we're here. and. Of course, we were all friends of Wally, and this was Wally's yeah. dream and, and, and Wally's memory. I mean, this is, yes, this is a great place. Wally was a good friend of all of ours and a, yes, and a great guy. And, you know, a lot of things that a lot of people don't realize, just in a closing thought, after the war is when racing, modern racing as we know it today, was created. Wally Parks organized drag racing. Mm -hmm. Bill France organized stock car racing. Tony Holman organized the Indianapolis Motor Speedway yep. to put it into its greatest years. That's true. I mean, these gentlemen created what we now know today as racing. Absolutely. And uh, this is the generation that was with them. They were part of that. So yep. anyway, great to talk to you, uh, Dick. Thanks, Thanks again Thank you. for all your hard work. Okay. <laughs>